So our next uh, speaker, carrying on with leadership and nutrition, is Yvonne Thompson. Uh, Yvonne's uh, presentation is New World Leadership. Yvonne Thompson is a nationally recognized author and acclaimed speaker with passion for creating positive energy in people and, or, and, organ, and organizations is felt and inspired in every keynote at conferences and conventions. She's, so she does a lot of conferences and conventions, Yvonne does. She spent, I think, Yvonne, you're at the Western Safety Conference just recently. She recognizes safety, leadership, and wellness working with both corporations and individuals across Canada. Yvonne is committed to spreading her message about the importance of leading self professionally and personally for better health, joy, and overall wellness. Her approach is clear, concise, and most importantly, infectious. So without further ado, Yvonne Thompson. Wow, I, um, I couldn't have asked for a better uh, um, presentation to go before mine. Um, it actually kind of distracted me a little bit. Um, so uh, thanks for that. That was really amazing. I want to start with um, something that someone gave this to me about eight years ago. I was speaking at a conference in Niagara Falls, and when it was over, this young fellow, and it was a safety conference. I actually started in the safety world many years ago. Um, so I, I used to speak your language. Um, I don't as well as I used to now. But um, And someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I think you'd like this. And it was out of a newspaper. And uh, so I'm just going to read it to you. Um, this is the Dominion Bank Rules of 1878. Because I want you to imagine where we have come from. It says here, godliness, cleanliness, and punctuality are the necessities of a good business. The firm has reduced the hours of work, and the clerical staff will now only have to be present between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Daily prayers will be held each morning in the main office, and the clerical staff will be present. Clothing must be of a sober nature. The clerical staff will not disport themselves in remnants of bright colors, nor will they wear hose unless in good repair. Uh, overshoes and top coats may be worn in the office, but neck scarves and headwear may not be worn at all. A stove is provided for the benefit of the clerical staff, and coal and wood must be kept in the locker. It is recommended that each member of the clerical staff bring four pounds of coal each day during the cold weather. No member of the clerical staff may leave the room without the permission of Mr. Rogers. The calls of nature are permitted, and the clerical staff may use the garden below the second gate. This area must be kept in good order. No, oh, this is my favorite. No talking allowed during business hours. I don't know what they did, but... Uh, the, ca the craving of tobacco, wines, and spirits is a human weakness, and as such is forbidden to all members of the staff. The owners recognize the new labor laws, but will expect a great rise in output of the work due to, the, to compensate for the near-utopian conditions. So I'm thinking, right, that things have really, really changed. And, um, uh, you know, the world that I live in, um, and I know the world that you live in, I mean, and some of you might say, well, things haven't changed that much, but I hope that nobody in the room is saying that. And I wanted to just give you a little bit, I, I always think it's important to look at where we've come from and uh, to be able to know where we're going, because things are changing so fast in our world. And I think sometimes we, we need to stop and look at uh, the growth, um, the evolution, and the changes that are taking place. And so um, I like this slide just because we got to remember that long, long time ago, in the early 1900s, um, you know, just getting off the farm and getting a job in a mine, you were the lucky one. You were the one that was going to get a paycheck, a regular paycheck. You wouldn't be in the field growing your own food. You would actually be the one sending money home. However, from a safety perspective, you were really on your own, really on your own. And when you look at the evolution of safety and where we've come from, from you know, moving to simple PPE, to programming, to sophisticated systems that we have today, I often wonder, like, where are we going? What's the next thing for us as it relates to leadership? And all of us have seen this model before, right? How much time, uh, for those of you in the room, that, that I know many of you are safety professionals, are we spending um, the time that we spend right at that loss, right at the incident? 
um, and compare that to, um, to earlier uh, causes and, um, and, and, and stepping away from the actual incidences and taking that big picture view and starting to look at, so what fundamentally is at the core of our incidents that take place in the workplace? And, 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 you know, I know that many organizations are saying, you know, it's all about those leading indicators and we've got to get away from the lagging, absolutely. But how far away are you from the incidences uh, when you're really looking at the big picture and looking at, at the whole uh, organization and the leadership that it takes to really, truly make a difference from a safety perspective? And so... I like to talk a little bit about this idea of safety leadership versus uh, corporate leadership. And I often wonder about um, what is the difference? Is there a difference? Can you have a poor corporate leadership and poor corporate culture and have great safety leadership? What are the chances of that? And what about your own personal leadership? as leaders in the, your businesses and in your communities, where does that all fit? Where does it all tie? Because I think it's all the same thing. I think that one of the challenges that we do in the safety world is we separate it out and we call it safety leadership. And I think we do that sometimes because we feel we don't have the um, influence that we want to have and we don't have the influence at the corporate level. But one of the messages I always encourage safety people to do is to always talk in terms of corporate leadership and really looking at the big picture because it is the culture in which we work in that actually dictates our ability to be highly successful from a leadership perspective and a safety perspective. So sometimes, again, I like to look at a little bit of past information. And in 1999, the Gallup Group, right? and some great books written uh, based on research, 10-year research study. And one of the things um, that they discovered was the number one thing why a person would leave their organization was the relationship with their immediate supervisor. So back then, if you had a poor relationship with your supervisor, uh, you were most likely to leave your organization. But as recent studies, more recent studies, like the Towers and Perrin Global Workforce Study, global meaning that there were many countries involved, which is different from the Gallup group, um, but there were 8,000 Canadians that were actually in this particular study, and they found a whole bunch of different things started to bubble up to the surface. The workers coming into the workplace today are looking for different things. And some of the things they talked about was this opportunity for being able to learn new things, the opportunity to actually have a relationship with senior leaders. I think that's really interesting, right? I want to know, know, know that my senior leader actually knows my name. I want to know that my manager actually knows who I am. And the video actually depicted that, the owner of that business saying that he didn't really know that gentleman. And I know it seems hard as a leader how well you know the people that are actually in the field, like yourselves, actually performing and doing the work. But the cool thing about this la most more recent study was that they would actually um, quit their organization. If the organization itself did not have a good reputation, if the senior leadership of an organization did not have a good reputation, if they didn't feel there were high levels of trust, younger workers today are up and gone. And what's that all about? And I've been doing the consulting gig for a really long time. And one of the things I often have uh, clients say to me is, you know, we've been trying to get the younger guys to, to assimilate into our culture and to kind of buy into what we've, you know, been selling for the last 50 years. And it's always worked. It's worked with every other generation. But it's not working with these younger generations. Interestingly enough, it's not actually working with the, the Gen Xs or uh, even my generation. Even baby boomers are starting to ask different questions and are starting to say, I want a different way. And so we know that things are really changing. We do know that employee engagement has a significant impact on our op operating ability, on our profits, on our ability to be high-performing organizations. And so how do we get great employee engagement? How do we get people to really want to be totally connected, not only to the work they perform, but to work, performing that work really safely? How do we do that? And I, I went out looking when I did my uh, master's thesis uh, on employee engagement, actually. I had to go find a great definition that was already existing. And this is the definition I found. And I really like this definition because what it does is it connects the human being to the emotional and intellectual. And I would actually add spiritual in here, too. 
because we tend to forget that, but we're spiritual beings as well. And I, I know that many of you know that. So it's not just about the emotional piece and the intellectual. Um, I need to be connected intellectually. I need to be challenged. I, I want interesting work. But I also need to be connected to my employer and to the work that I do and to my colleagues, to the people that I work with. I want to have that relationship. So what did we learn from all these studies? And what do we know for sure? We have to be able to stand in our employees' shoes. We have to know what their experience is all about. And that was, again, something that came from the video we just watched. How much do we know what their experience is? And some of you intimately know what their experiences are about. You've done it. You've walked in their shoes. But some of you don't. You've, you've stepped away far enough from the actual physical work that you don't actually know. And I mean really feel it, not just say, well, I did that 20 years ago. I mean feel what it's like to be in the bush doing what they do. Or be on the highway for all those long hours moving the lumber. So we have to be able to do that. Now, here's the other thing that's really neat, is there is some research out there that the human being is actually changing, that we are actually seeing physiological, emotional, and spiritual changes in the human being. And some of you, again, are experiencing some of these changes. And you're wondering, some of you have, how many of you in the room have young children? Anybody have young children, like sort of under, under 10, under 12, under 13? A have you ever noticed how smart they are? Does it bug you? Like, it, it's like, I have, a, I have three kids. I have a 30-year-old, a 28-year-old, and a 26-year-old. I am blown away how smart they are. Like, it is weird. And they're friends. I mean, they're reading books I didn't even think about reading until I was in my 40s. It really blows my mind how intelligent and smart these young kids are. So there is some early evidence that the brain is starting to rewire itself. And that, in fact, young people are actually being born not only really smart, but very connected to their intuitive side. And if we were to look back to this, and we were to look back to what we used to manage with, very, very left brain, very technical and process-oriented. And I'm not suggesting that we need to give that up, because that's where efficiencies come in, we build great systems, we build great process. But one of the challenges that we've experienced in the last 100 years is we've been dialing down the intuitive part, the instinctive part, the part that says, does this feel right? Should I do this? Does it make sense? And how do we as individuals start to lead our ability to dial that up so that we can set an example for those in the field? Because that's what we truly want them to do. If we want them to actually, because they are the only ones, by the way, that can reduce our incident rates. The ones in the field doing the work are the ones that can reduce. We can support, absolutely, and we've got to be able to provide the support and the systems. But in the end, it is those in the field that actually have control over reducing the incident rates. So if we only rely on the left brain, the rule book, what does the rule book say? What do the guidelines say? What does the system say? Even what does my supervisor say? The left, what's my employer going to say if I do this? Oh, what about fear? All those things that come into play when people make decisions. Instead of learning ourselves individually and teaching our employees how to go inside and actually activate the intuitive part of our, ourselves. And, and it's a really interesting field to be working in. So we want to recognize that the human being is actually evolving. And if we only rely on left brain, and I, it's interesting, right, because about 10, 15 years ago, there was all this research on the right brain, right, the creativity and all the um, innovation comes from the right brain. But now there's huge research on the heart center, which I don't have time today to go into, but if you're interested, it's fascinating stuff, that there's some real um, indications that the heart does way more than pump blood throughout the body. And I know that sounds a bit weird, but it actually has the ability to guide us. And to, and to help us use that as a tool when we come to making decisions. So change is coming. Change is already here. You're hiring young people, people that are, that are actually highly, much more intuitive than my generation. I have to practice it. But many of the young people are actually bo being born with a heightened level of intuitive ability to actually guide themselves. But at the core, whether you're 60 and close to retirement or whether you are 16 and just entering the workforce, what we know to be true is that we all are in this species, the human being, and that we want to belong. We want to contribute. We want to bring value. 
We want to have some fun, and we want to feel that at the end of the day, we're further along. Every single one of us wants to be able to do that. So I ask you a question, and I want you to think about this, and, it, and, and I just want you to take a minute and think about who manages you best? Who manages you best? And it doesn't matter where I go, it doesn't matter how big the audience or how small, I get the same answer everywhere I go. I do, of course. So why do we think our frontline employees in the field are any different than us? They simply want the opportunity to lead and manage themselves. And I know that that is really scary to many employers. It's like, you got to be kidding me. What if we, you know, the whole idea of chaos and lack of, you know, control and all those things start to bubble up to the surface. But here's the thing, if we build the right systems and if we teach the right things and if we model the right things as it relates to responsible self-management and responsible self-leadership, we can actually get the best pieces of our frontline employees activated in a real compelling way right out in the field where they're working. So here's how it works. I want everybody to consider those old-fashioned scales. You know the ones where we used to put the, what we wanted to buy on one side and we put the weights on the other side to see how much we were buying? So I want you to imagine you each have your own scale. And on the right side, I want you to put a couple of things. How much time in one month, you can use a month or you can use any given week, whatever you want to use as your time frame, do you spend trying to influence plan and direct or lead your significant other in your life. You know, you really want your partner to kind of do it the way you do it, okay? If you're like me, it's like, you know, mine's actually way down here, but that's a whole different story that we're not going to go to today. Okay, so you, you got that on the right-hand side. And then I want you to add to that, how much time do you spend, if you have children, directing, guiding, facilitating, and leading, you want your children to do it the way that you think it needs to be done. So you're really leading them. Okay? Now, if you have elder parents, and you know it's time for dad to get a walk or, or mom to think about getting home care, how much time do you spend right, facilitating, leading, directing your senior parents? And you haven't gone to work yet. And what if you sit on a board in the community? How much influence are you trying to have? But now you go to work, and I want you to add that to it. How much time in any given period of time frame that you're using do you spend trying to lead, direct, plan, facilitate, manage those around you? And I want you to compare that to the left side of your scale. How much time in that same time period do you spend intentionally and deliberately leading yourself? Because if you're like me or like most people, your scale is completely out of whack. And I am fascinated by that concept. I am really fascinated by what is it about the human being that we actually think we need to be in everybody else's life, and yet we're not actually spending any significant amount of time leading ourselves, being intentional and deliberate, and really going within and saying, what's the right thing to do in this situation? So what we try to do is make sure, I always try, to make sure that people understand that leading self is at the core of everything. Because if you don't think that every time you open your mouth, every time you do or say anything in front of colleagues, or in particular those in the field, you're modeling the way. The question is, are you modeling the right way? Are you modeling the way in the right direction? Are you sending the right messages? Do you ask the right questions? Do you give answers, or do you say, what do you think you need to do? What's your gut telling you is the right decision in this case? Because they know, they know the answer. So developing a culture of, safe, of, of leadership, self-leadership, requires that we actually start to think about what we think about. What are we thinking about? And one of the challenges in today's work context is we are really busy being busy. And we are thinking about everything that we have to get done. And sometimes we feel heavily burdened with a lot of stress. And so we end up with some negative conversations. So another question for you to consider 
is how much time in any given day do you have conversation going on up here? So if there's eight hours of sleep a day, we'll make the assumption that everybody gets eight hours of sleep. I know that's a stretch, but we'll just, we'll make that assumption. So for me, that would mean there's, I'm not great at math, but I think there's 16 hours left in the day. Of those 16 hours left in a day, how much time do you have something going on up here? And most people say to me, well, 16 hours, right? Doesn't most people have, you know, 15 hours and, you know, 57 minutes? Like, doesn't everybody, right? So then I ask a couple more questions. Like, so how many of those thoughts are really positive and how many are negative? How many are make you feel great and move you forward in the right direction and are really about conscious and deliberate leadership of you? And how many of those thoughts are negative and that, are, are, that hold you back, that don't make you feel great at all? You know, whether the conversation in your head is about your boss, I know that doesn't happen in any of your organizations, but you know, some of my clients, that's a conversation they have. If it's about your partner or about your children because they're driving you nuts. The real question is, what are you thinking about? And who is that person you're having a conversation with anyway? Have you thought about that? I refer to it as my roommate, right? And I have these conversations with my roommate all the time. Now, but it's also better known as our ego. And most of us are having a conversation with our ego all the time. So you can call it roommate, ego, whatever you want to call it. The question is, self-leadership requires that you monitor what's actually going on up here. Because your thoughts affect how you feel. And your feelings affect your emotions. And your emotions affect your behaviors. And your behaviors absolutely affect your actions. And your actions create your outcomes. Whether you like it or not, I find very few people who will discredit this. We know that what we think about affects how we feel. And I know that, you know, as safety professionals, you're always thinking about the people in the field. And the question is, I, and I really believe this, and I've seen it work over and over and over again, first you got to start here, because they know if you're not doing it yourself. You're asking them to do it, and that's the problem. We're out telling all the time, but we're not necessarily modeling the way. Do you monitor what you think about and how it makes you feel? Are you, because here's the other thing that's really cool, and I love, you know, this is the best time, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best time to be alive. Because it's okay, you can actually talk about energy in, in organizations now. You can talk about, is there positive energy in this meeting, or is there negative energy? Anybody ever walked into a meeting, and it's like, oh, God, I want to die. The energy in here is sucking the life out of me, and no one's said anything yet. Right? Totally different when you walk into a room and the energy is amazing and there's, you can feel it. It's not, it's, it's visceral. This is, what it, this is what the young generation and the people you're hiring, this is the skill set they have naturally. So the problem is, let's say for example, you think that a new initiative is, a, is just a waste of time. You know, we get new projects, we get new initiatives all the time and you go, but you know, I got to go out and sell it to the team. So you go out and you're going to sell it to the team. And your mouth is saying all the right things. I want you to consider, do you really think they don't feel your energy? Because you are not fooling anyone. You take it with you everywhere you go. You take your energy everywhere you go. And so that energy is produced by what you think about and what you feel. So I want to share a really, really quick personal story, and I got tons of them, but I'm just going to share this very quick one, probably about um, a long time ago, 18, 19 years ago. Um, I was one of these people that was very, uh, uh, what would you call, um, per type A personalities, very driven, worked my butt off, workaholic, all you have to do is ask my husband. I, we lived in central Canada, he worked for a big utility, and, um, and I got this great opportunity in, in uh, actually in Vancouver, and I was gone for eight months, and we had three little kids, and he was a shift worker, so I wasn't a very nice person. But anyway, 
I was a workaholic, climbing the corporate ladder, doing all the things that, you know, my mom and dad thought were just great, you know, scoring all the points. But eventually what happened was um, I got this great job, 250 unionized employees, big, huge facility. So I've, you know, I've worked the graveyard shift. I put on the steel-toed boots. I've done, I've done all of that. And one day I get fired. And, and, and out you go. They actually walked me to the parking lot. They actually walked me to the parking I mean, how, right? And I hadn't done, I hadn't stolen anything. I hadn't done anything wrong. It was just a, a and I, I, you know. But here's the thing that's interesting about it. I had been successful my whole life. I had sacrificed a ton to get where I was, and suddenly, I was out. They didn't want me, and it absolutely cut me off at the knees and took my breath away. And for six months, the biggest pity party that you could ever imagine, there was a big, huge cloud over Winnipeg. There's usually a cloud over Winnipeg, but that particular year, huge cloud over Winnipeg right over my house. Biggest pity party you could ever imagine. The stories I told myself in my head debilitated me. I couldn't go on job interviews. Certainly the one glass of wine a night turned into three, right? Gained lots of weight, ate lots of potato chips. Because the stories I was telling me was how dare them, the anger, the frustration, the emotional outrage. And yet, and yet, and we all have one of these stories, by the way. Some much worse than that one. Some not so, not as bad. But what was interesting about this, what was the catalyst to me starting my own business and actually figuring out what I wanted to really truly do and how I could follow my heart center and how I could get in alignment and then help other people learn how to be in alignment. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. But it took me two and a half years to actually remember the conversation that got me fired. I had one conversation with my boss. He asked me to do something and I said no. You think there was a bit of ego going on? <laughs> there was lots of this going on, right? So my point is, is that what I thought about truly affected how I felt. I felt unworthy. I didn't feel like I was good enough. I didn't know that I would ever get back up on my feet. I, no, if they didn't want me, nobody was going to want me. It affected everything. It affected my emotional state. It affected my behaviors and my actions. But when I look back now, and I know you all have one of these stories, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And if you were to ask my children, now here's the cool part, ask my children what the best Christmas they ever had. And all three of them, independently, interviewed independently, would say, the E.I. Christmas. Because <laughs> mom was home. Mom was baking. Mom was actually trimming the tree with them, right? Everything, in every situation we have in, that we experience, the desired and undesired events, every single one of them, there's a golden opportunity. There is a nugget in there. The problem is we're not looking for the nugget of opportunity because we're so doing this with the ego and the roommate in our head. So are you on autopilot? Are you reacting to life situations instead of intentionally and deliberately leading yourself and modeling the way? Does it feel right? Does it feel right? And I do want to say something. I'm just going to go back for one second because I think this is important. Um, research would indicate that change doesn't happen at the thinking stage. Change actually happens at the feeling stage. The problem is you can't invoke different feelings if you don't change what you think about. So it's kind of a weird thing. We need both but you won't actually see the shift in anything you're trying to accomplish or anything that's really important to you, your desires, intentions, all those things. You won't actually see the shift until you shift how you feel about it. So you have to change what you think about to change how you feel, but the real, the real um, richness is in changing how you feel because that is when you ignite different emotions and different behaviors and you automatically get different results and it's fascinating. So you've got to ask yourself, how frequently am I on autopilot? And am I reacting to life situations, or am I intentionally stepping back and saying, what is the right thing to do here? What does my gut, not just the left brain, and I'm not suggesting you don't look at the facts and the evidence and the stats and all the things that we bury ourselves in, but actually take a moment to dial up the intuition, gut feel, heart center, and say, does this feel right? because that is where change can really happen. 
That is when you start to become an intentional and deliberate leader of you. And trust me, you start doing that, you will be shocked at what the impact, the ripple effect to the people around you. Because really what you want to do is have long-term sustainable change and shift to the people you lead. But you can't do that if you're not doing this piece first, because they, they got your number. They know that you're not doing it yourself. You're just out there telling them what to do. You're saying, well, you do it. You do it first, right? So when you do it yourself, when you step back, drop your shoulders, take a deep breath, and say, what's the right thing, and listen to that intuition. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever done something you knew you shouldn't do, but you did it anyway? I know I have, like more than once, unfortunately, <laughs> right? More than once, right? What is that? And how did you know that you shouldn't have done it? Well, it was that little voice. But the voice wasn't up here. Usually it's in here. It's in the belly, it's in the gut, it's in the heart center saying, don't do it, 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 don't do it. Ah, oh, shoot, I did it, right? That's how it works, because we're so um, uh, trained I mean, how many of you want to go back to that model 100 years ago? None of us. We are evolving without question. So what's the next step for us as it relates to leadership and really dealing and getting to the bottom of our safety, um, uh, our, our issues, our in incidents and injury rates? It's about starting here. And as you start here, what happens is people say, I want what you have. I want what you have. You're positive, you're optimistic, you always come and ask great questions. You don't tell me, you engage me in a fascinating and interesting conversation. You trust me because you ask me how I feel about the situation and what I need to do next. You send a different message because as you teach it to yourself and as you learn it for yourself, you suddenly start having different conversations with people. So first you have to become the observer, the observer of you the observer of your thoughts, the observer of what's going on. And how do you know you have to step back and think about what you're thinking about? How do you know? Because you don't feel good. Every time you don't feel good, every time something feels, I call it prickly, you know that prickly feeling, it's just not right, it's just edgy. Why? Why am I edgy? Why is it prickly? Go up and ask. And what you'll find is you're having a conversation in your head about something that doesn't fit, that is negative, that is judgmental, that is not healthy for you, or often the person you are thinking about. Because a lot of times your thoughts are not about you, it's about someone else and what they're doing. So you need to start becoming the observer. The other thing that's really interesting, I love this one, we um, often use the observer as one of our, it's one of our tools that we teach and I have a book coming out in three weeks that talks about all the tools that really help us to start being these great leaders of ourselves. But I love this one and I, I want each of you to imagine a stage, a huge, not a stage, a huge auditorium, a massive auditorium with millions of seats in it and this big huge stage in the center. And in that auditorium, in that, in that big theater, there's a chair with your name on it. No one else can ever sit in that chair but you. It is yours. So you sit in that chair, and the drama of life is taking place on the stage. The stuff that we deal with, the things that we watch, whether it's the mother-in-law, whether it's our partner, whether it's stuff happening at work, whatever it happens to be is all playing out. Does anybody here know anyone that's like a drama queen? There's always stuff going on in their life. You know, most of us know one person like that, right? And we think, wow, no wonder your life sucks, right? Because you're telling everybody about how much your life sucks. Well, guess what? If that's all you think about, you're just going to produce more life that sucks. I mean, that's the truth, and we know it inside. If we go inside, we know the truth. We know that when all we think about is how our life sucks, all we do is produce more of that. So you're sitting in this chair, and no one else, no matter what, can sit in it. You get to intentionally and deliberately decide when you step on the stage, when you interact, when you provide your, uh, your knowledge, your experience. You are leaders, absolutely, and you are safety experts. 
You are hired for your education, your experience, your skills, and your abilities. So you definitely want to be stepping onto that stage when it comes to your expertise. But here's the thing. You deliver the information, and you go back to your seat. And you get to decide, because you're not on autopilot, because you're observing your thoughts, you get to decide when to step onto the stage and when you're going to sit in the seat and just watch the drama unfold. Have you ever felt like this, Ant? How many of you have been boulder pushers? Do you know what I mean by being a boulder pusher? I think you know. I think you know. You know that thing that you really want to have happen, you really want it to change, and you're just stuck, like they're making a decision you don't think is right, and you're trying to convince everybody that you shouldn't do that, or something's going on in your family, and some of you are pushing a boulder, which is your children, trying to get them to do what you think they should do. Right? What happens when you're the ant for a long period of time? We get exhausted. Often, my experience has been the boulder just kind of rolls downhill and squishes me like a bug, like an ant. And then if I'm really stupid, I get back up and start boulder pushing again. Right? Acceptance is one of the key fundamental tools we need to use. Don't boulder push. It doesn't work. And often, we're boulder pushing, we're trying to change something that doesn't have anything to do with us. And so what happens is, um, we use a model, which I, haven't, I don't have today, I didn't feel I had time to share with you, it's called the tree. And it's often we refer to it as climbing someone else's tree. We're, we're always trying to climb someone else's tree. We're always trying to tell someone else what to do or how to do it. Instead of asking great questions and letting them climb their own tree, grow their own tree, nurture their own tree, make their own decisions, use that intuitive self, encourage them to lead self. And the way you do that is not to tell them to lead self, but to lead you. Because you create this amazing organic influence. So being able to detach from outcomes is one of the most important skills we can learn. And I know that that seems so counterintuitive to us because we think our job is to keep pushing the boulder for change. But I have to tell you, I mean, I've been doing this gig a really long time. And if we don't do things differently soon, we just get exhausted because we spin our wheels and it doesn't change. But when we start to detach and accept and we start to go inside and say, what is the right thing for me to do in this situation? You change your energy, and, the, and you change the conversations. And the minute you do that, the people around you start to notice it. And this is where true, true empowerment comes. And it is extremely easy with practice. And I love what Al said, it is a practice. And it, this is not something that changes overnight. It is a practice that we're all needing to work on all of the time. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time you judged something? Some of you are judging me right now. I know. Right? What is that? What is that human nature we have about everything? You know, someone saying, what's with the red shoes? Right? I gave up heels a month ago. I'm so proud of myself. I said, I don't care what anyone says. I will not wear heels anymore. I'm buying every color of running shoe I can find because I'm on my feet all the time. Here's the thing. We judge almost everything, everything. And what we need to start asking ourselves is why. How does it bring value? How does it bring value into my life? How does it bring value into the person that I'm judging or the situation that I'm judging? And what's that all about, especially if it's negative? So one of the things I want to, and I always get asked the question, well, wait a second. We have to evaluate. We have to evaluate our peers. We evaluate our employees. We evaluate at work. We evaluate our safety stats. We're always evaluating. Well, there's a difference between judgment and evaluation. And it's the connection to the emotion. Because a judgment usually has a negative emotion attached to it, which will never serve you and will never move you forward. So the next time you go to have a negative conversation about something in your life or in your work, think about it and ask yourself, because you're becoming the observer of your thoughts, ask yourself, how does this serve me? And how does it hurt, serve the person I'm about to tell the story to? Because if it doesn't serve, you might want to consider not doing it. Evaluation 
is when you can detach emotionally and say, here's the vax. No emotion. I, I'm not judging it. I'm just simply saying this is what I see. This is what I've experienced. This is what the stats tell us. But there isn't this negative judgment, right? And by the way, this really also, um, for those of you that are highly introverted, a lot of the conversations you have in your head about yourself, because you're not good enough, you got to really monitor that, right? Because that's just not true, and it's a story you tell yourself. And the minute you get rid of that story, and the minute you change that story to a positive story about all the things you do really, really well, you will be blown away at how the results you get change. So if you're not getting the things you want, you want to start looking at that. And are you heavily judgmental of yourself? This is one that I really love. And I actually learned this uh, in a conversation with my uh, uh, middle son. My middle son is a, a huge uh, improver, spoken word poet. Um, he lives in Victoria and uh, ran away from home. I still say that he ran away from home, but he moved from Winnipeg to Victoria um, for, the, for the cultural scene and the acting and the improv. And so he works about three shifts a week in a restaurant to pay for his lifestyle, which is always at an improv thing, always at a tr thing. And he's a coach. He coaches young people in high schools to do improv and spoken word poetry. And he's a really amazing young person. But we had this conversation because he really looks up to the guy who is considered like the guru of improv in Victoria. There's a fellow that is really well known nationally. And Scott looks up to this guy like crazy, right? And he always talks about, Steve is this amazing guy, right? And I, and I, and I know how talented Scott is. I've watched him over the years. And he has a significant reputation and following for the work that he does. And I said, Scott, why do you put Steve on a pedestal? Why do you do that? What is it about that that you do that? Why? What is that about? Because, and then I asked him a really good question. So I asked him that question, and then I asked him the question, so if you do that with Steve, do you expect your students to do that with you? And is it possible that when you walk into the classroom to teach improv, that the energy you give off is, I'm the teacher, you're the student? I want all of you to think about a teacher you had in school, two teachers the one that treated everyone as if they had something to teach the teacher, someone who was open and listening and was sharing in a really open way versus the teacher who walked in and said, I'm the teacher, you're the student, sit down and be quiet. Which one did you learn more from? Which one did you become more open to? Which one helped you to keep moving forward? So I had this conversation with him about when you put Steve on a pedestal, it does not serve you at all. So the tool and one of the things we like to get leaders to, to think about is no one behind you, no one in front of you. Right? No one in front of you, no one behind you. No one above you, no one below you. And I know our organizations are really structured like that. There's always someone above us. But how you interact with the people that you have direct influence on, if the messaging you're sending is, I'm the safety person and I'm the safety cop, they're not hearing you. They're not listening to you. But when you walk in and ask a great question, and you're curious, and you're out to discover what, they're, what it's like to be in their shoes, you get a totally different response. You ask, and then you listen. And then you really start to discover, because you're there to explore what's really going on for them, you start to really discover what's going on for them and what they're thinking about. And now you can ask more great questions to help lead them to lead themselves to make great decisions out in the field. No one in front, no one behind. One moment you're the teacher, the next moment you're the student. Because that's how life works. The best teachers, the best facilitators are the ones that walk into the room knowing they have as much to learn from the student as the student has to learn from them. I love this. Not my circus, not my monkeys. I want you to practice this one when someone tries to give you their monkey. Right? How many times does someone try to give you their monkey? Let me tell you about my problems again. And I'd like you to take some of my problems. You just go, not my circus, not my monkey. Get off my tree. 
get off my tree, or, or you could use this one. This is one of my favorites. Who's seen this before? I love this. Can you guys read that from there? No, no one can, oh man, sorry. Okay, so, so he gets, he, he says, I have something to give you, and he gives him a bag, and he says, what's in it? It's walrus poo, right? And it's a metaphor for, you know, how many times does someone try to give you a bag of walrus poo? Right? And the, and it, and the whole car, cartoon is about the fact that, you know what? I don't want your walrus poo. I'm going to lead me. I'm going to work on me. Because uh, here's the deal. And we all know this, but we don't practice it, which is odd to me. But here's the thing that's really, really important. You will never change the people in the field doing the work. You are, if you're trying to change your boss, how many, oh, don't put your hands up. I was just going to ask how many of you are trying to change your boss. Don't do that one. Don't put your hand up. But, you know, you're, 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 you're pushing the boulder, right? You're the ant pushing the boulder. If you're trying to change your wife, by the way, or your husband, good luck with that, right? Good luck with that. So here's the thing. You know, don't take someone else's bag of walrus poo, right? Don't take their monkeys because it's not your circus, it's not your tree. But what you can do is you can absolutely nurture your own leadership. You can nurture from the inside out every decision and everything that you do. You can ask yourself, does this feel right? And if it doesn't feel right, I'm going to share a really quick story with you. So I had this business. I started this business um, 14 years ago. And I started off actually in the safety world because I could do it. I was good at it. At least I thought I was good at it. But my long-term goal was always to work in the leadership side. And, but I needed to start somewhere when I started my business. And, and I had had a lot of experience in it, so I started it out. And then I went back to school and I got my HR. So I did my CHRP. and. And I got really involved in the HR community. And, and it was a big decision to do that because HR doesn't have a great reputation. Um, and, and that's a whole nother conversation. And, um, and so, but anyway, so I did that, right? And eventually what happened was this business grew and grew and grew to the point where we ended up with like 13, 14 full-time consultants. And we had these projects. We did everything. We did recruitment. We did you know, um, job specification, and we did interviewing for people, and we did safety. We had a safety div division that just did safety work. And, and then I went back to school again, and I got my master's in leadership from Royal Roads. And, and I wrote my first book, and I was just totally, like, stepping away, stepping away, stepping away from all the HR stuff. But this business just happened to be, <laughs> it just kept growing. And I, and I, I was miserable. I mean, I was, I wasn't, I mean, and people would look at me and go, wow, like, look what you've created. You've got all these people working for you. I'm like, yeah, you don't have a 50,000, uh, you know, um, payroll every month that you've got to figure out how to pay and all that stuff. But I was running a business, and I didn't want to run a business. I wasn't an entrepreneur. I mean, I, 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 people thought I was, but I really wasn't on the inside. So I had this opportunity to go down to New York, and I don't know if any of you would know who Cheryl Richardson is, but she's pretty famous. She used to be on the Oprah show for years, and, but I'm dating myself, so anyway. Cheryl Richardson is there. She's a master coach. She's worked with, she was one of the first founders of the International Fe uh, Coaching Federation. And she's working with us because she's written tons of um, books, New York bestseller books, and I was working on my second book, and so I went down to meet with her. And anyway, there was a Q&A part, and so all these people are coming up to the mic. So she's on the stage, and there's a group of people. There was, it was pretty intimate. There was only about 30 of us. And so you could get up to the mic, and you could ask her a question, right? And I'm doing the arrogant thing in my chair, and I'm having the conversation with my ego saying, I'm not getting up. Now I'll let everyone else get up. I'm not getting I don't have any questions, right? And then on day two, I was like, oh, I really have a question. Like, I, you know, I should, I should get up, I should get up. Anyway, I do this conversation in my head, and then once I say, stop being such an arrogant cow and get up and ask her the question you want to ask her. So I do. I'm the very last, I, I make the decision at the very last hour, and I'm in the lineup. I get up, and I get to the mic. So she's here, and I'm there, standing in a mic, and, she's, and I say, and I tell her this little story, and I'm very brief. I just say, I really want to be doing my passion. I really, and I just, I'm stuck. I'm really stuck. And she said, Yvonne, close your eyes. So I went like this. And then I went like this. She said, no, 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 I mean it. Close your eyes and keep them closed. So I closed my eyes. And she said to me, you do this for a living. You know exactly what you need to do. You just refuse to be honest with yourself. And I knew I was caught. 
because the feelings I'd had for a year were, get out. You don't want to do this. It doesn't make you happy. It isn't, it isn't jazz in you. It's not where you need to be. And so the decision was made. I got on the plane, went back, got my team together and said, I hate to break it to you, but in a year from now, it won't look anything like it looks now. And in fact, that's what we did. We sold off the safety division. We gave great contracts away to some of our competitors. And all I kept, there were three of us in the end, and all we do is leadership and executive coaching. But there's an example, right, just a very simple example of me not listening. And I teach this stuff, right? So be, having that ability to go inside and truly, truly listen to the messages that are coming to us. Here's the other thing. And I want you to think about this. Honesty before kindness, always. Now, for some of you, that invokes a, a bit of emotion. you got to be kidding me. Honesty before kindness. Last time I taught this in one of our leadership classes, one of the guys in the class said, so you mean I'm supposed to t really tell my son that he sucks at soccer? And I said, well, you don't have to say it that way. But how are you serving him when he comes home and, and, and you've watched the game and you go, oh, you were great, you were the star of the game. And he sat on the bench most of the time. How do, you, how do we teach our children when we're not even honest with them, we're not honest with our partners? I can tell you that many of the clients, when we first start working with them building leadership programs, I come right out and say, you guys aren't honest with each other. You sit around the boardroom table and you know, we're not being direct and honest. We're kind of saying what we think we're supposed to say. We're, we're always trying to please someone. So here's how it works. It's honesty with good intentions equals kindness. So if I monitor my intent, when I go in to have a conversation, when I go in to work or talk to one of the guys in the field or one of the gals in the field, is my intention to make them wrong or is my intention to help them stay safe? And if I monitor my intent, I can be really honest, and I can ask a really great question. And it's amazing how you can form a statement into a question to get them to open up. So I sense that, or I think that maybe, is it possible, I love that one, try it the next time you want to make a real message. Is it possible that maybe there's a better way to do that? As opposed to walking in and saying, blah, 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 you need to do that. A coaching conversation is about being honest while monitoring intent and asking great questions. And when you practice that, and again, it's a practice, but as you practice it, it's amazing how other people around you say, I want a piece of that, I want a piece of that, and I feel good, I feel trusted. He's asking my opinion, he's asking me a great question. That must mean he thinks I have a good answer. And the one thing we know for sure is that we don't have the answer for another person. We just don't. We only have the answers for ourselves. So what we can do, and here's the thing, especially when you're trying to get someone to shift their thinking around safety, ask them a great question as opposed to telling them the answer. Because I want to ask you how you feel when your boss just tells you, you're going to do this, this is the way it's going to be done. What happens to you from a, an emotional, a thinking, feeling, and emotional level? If we go back to the fact that most of us want to lead ourselves and want to self-manage, responsible self-management, what we intuitively know is that it doesn't work well. I always use the thing about the four-year-old and brushing their teeth. You know, brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth. How well does that work? Every night we go through the same thing. Brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth. It doesn't work. But if we say, what do you think would happen if you never brushed your teeth again? Let's have a competition. I won't brush my teeth for three days. You don't brush your teeth for three days, and then we'll check them out and see what they feel like. That's a different message to a four-year-old than brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth, brush your teeth. If you're trying to make significant change, you have to start with yourself. And then you have different conversations with the people that you're leading, and it is absolutely amazing the results you get. You can truly, truly change the outcomes by being intentional, deliberate, and present. So what does it mean? It means you do have to slow down. It does mean you have to make different choices. It does mean you have to be the observer of the thoughts that are going on with your ego. 
it does mean that you have to monitor whether you're bold or pushing. When I go into that conversation, am I trying to make the other person wrong and myself right? Or can I try a different approach and ask some great questions and lead the person to some great answers and help them figure it out for themselves? Because they're going to remember that conversation. They're going to remember the messaging. You know why? Because they created it. So you go into the conversation deliberately, intentionally to explore the issue in an effort to discover great answers and allowing the other person to discover great answers. But it's all about you leading yourself first. Because if you're on autopilot, if you're not being present-minded and conscious and deliberate, you can't do any of this stuff. It always starts with you, always, always, always. It's about your personal and professional development. And I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. How much do you do for you? In any given week, how much time do you spend just on you? And I don't mean, you know, the, the hockey game at the end of the day because you're so exhausted with a cold beer. I mean actually something that you really liked, and I know the guys always say, come on, that's a bad example, Yvonne, because I love hockey. But I, I, I mean that that whole, I mean, we are busy working and providing, especially the men in the room, you believe your role is to provide for the family still. I mean, we still live in a really weird world. Um, we're raising kids, we're looking after kids, we're helping our, our elder parents. How much time in any given day are you giving to just you? And so I, it, I would like to leave you with some thoughts around what could you do for you that you really, really like to do. And we do tons and tons of coaching. And it's amazing when I ask that question. I had a guy who's an MBA with an engineering degree. And I asked him the question, and he said, like, nothing. And I said, well, think of a time when you used to do something you really, really liked. So this guy was way high up in a big, huge 8,000 company employee, uh, um, empl manager. And he'd lost out on a couple of um, senior positions. And so you know, he asked if I would work with him. Wanted to figure out why. And it turned out, I said to him, so how did you end up being an engineer, right? He said, well, I really wanted to be an artist. But my dad said I'd never make a living as an artist, so I became an engineer. That's an interesting shift. So I said, when was the last time, what kind of art? He said, I drew, I had, did charcoal drawings. And I said, when was the last time you, and he said, like 26 years ago. Pardon me? 26 years since you picked up the charcoal? So that was his homework for the month. Just pick up the charcoal. He brings in the next month when we go to meet the most gorgeous drawing of his daughter, who's 18. I mean, just stunning replica of his daughter. And I said, has she seen it yet? And he said, no. And that, you know, that's a big, so that's a huge shift. And guess what? He's now got different conversations going on in his head, and he's getting different results. He's getting different results. So personal and professional development, it's about you. If you're not working on you, how can you ever think that you can have influence on other people? This organic, this, co this concept, I write about this in the new book, this idea of organic influence. You influence the people around you, and you influence the results by doing nothing but leading yourself. Going inside and saying, what is the right thing to do here? You intuitively already know what the right thing to do is. The problem is we're so busy being busy that we're on autopilot. So when you start to change what you think about, as you slow down and you just take care of you and you start to really become intentional and deliberate, it is amazing how this organic influence works because people, you start to become consistent, balance. Your stress reduces, by the way, because let's just talk for one second, I'm going to digress here. The situations taking place out in the world, on the stage, I know that you think that's what causes your stress. Too much work, my wife never listens to me, my husband drives me crazy, I got a 16-year-old kid, blah, 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 blah. But the actual situation is not causing your stress. It's what you do with it when it comes in here. It's what you do with it when it comes into your head and has a conversation with your roommate. That's what creates the stress. And then what happens, and I've lived this personally, I almost lost my son Scott to suicide, and I will tell you that this model that I teach came from that experience, that life experience. 
because what I did in my head just about wiped out my whole family. So the fact of the matter is, the situations occurring out here are not actually what's creating your stress. What's creating your stress is what you do with it when it comes inside your head. And we know that stress does not stay in the mind very long. What it does is it immediately produces additional cortisol, cortisol, pardon me, additional hormones, which is what long-term having those jacked up affects the immune system, which is why they are di directly linking most of our diseases to stress. So if you don't think that what you think about matters, you're sadly mistaken. So replace your thoughts with good feeling thoughts, thoughts that create and invoke great feelings. And as you change your thoughts to create great feelings, you will make right decisions every time. You will have right conversations. You will find the way to be honest with good intentions. You'll ask great questions and allow the other person to explore for themselves what works and what doesn't work. Because every single one of those people out there in your industry are truly want to bring their best. They want to go home safe. They want to contribute to the organization. They absolutely want to belong and fit in. So you set the example, you lead the way. When you lead self, you never have to worry about the stuff on the outside. It organically takes care of itself because people want what you have without a doubt. Leadership, safety leadership, corporate leadership, individual leadership is absolutely an evolution. It is about growth. None of you in this room want to die the same way you were when you were 30. It is about shifting, growing, changing. That's where the richness is. That's where the fun is. So, do or do not, there is no try. Do or do not, there is no try. Please do not try to reduce incidents. Don't hope that it will get better. It doesn't work. What works is change what you think about, change how you feel, and you will absolutely create different results. I just want to leave by saying that I am deeply sorry I cannot stay. I have a family issue in the hospital, so I'm heading straight back down to Victoria. And um, I have left some brochures. They're out in the exhibit area. And if anybody wants my new book, you will be able to contact me. And I've left some information about our leadership programs that are coming up in Victoria. So I um, didn't want to do a sales pitch, but I just wanted you to know that I won't be here to speak with you. And I apologize deeply for that, because I always like to hang around. So thank you so much.